Go. Lights, camera, action. All right, done. Let's get started. All right, now, thank you for that, Alex. Next step in the um, industrial chemistry is looking at Le Chatelet's principle. Um, don't have to really worry about how you pronounce the name, it's a French, uh, French guy, but we want to have a look at how we use that to move the position of equilibrium. LCP is what I use. You can't use that in the exam, by the way, so you need to have Le Chatelet's principle and use the full word in your explanation. Anyway, so all we're doing now is we are moving the position of equilibrium as a result of external changes. So all we're doing is this. For a reaction at equilibrium, we are trying to make it do this, or that. That's all we're doing. So how do I push equilibrium to the right, towards products? How do I push equilibrium to the left, to reactants? Now, the application of this is mainly to do with products. So most of the time, in all the chemical reactions we're going to look at, we're focusing on products. Anyone have any idea why? Why are we going to focus on products? Because we start with the reactants. Sort of. Okay. If it's industrial chemistry, obviously you want the products. Industrial chemistry says we're making a chemical, making a product. Yeah. So all the stuff that we're doing in the lead up or in, in, the, in the following few lessons will be looking at mainly products. So what conditions favour the equilibrium to the right? Because that's going to give me more products. We call that percentage yield. So that's the connection between Le Chatelet's principle and equilibrium. And if you don't understand Le Chatelet's principle, you can't understand how to move the position of equilibrium. Because as you can see over here, do I increase pressure? Do I decrease pressure? Do I increase concentration of reactants? Or do I take products away as they're produced? Some of these are logical. Or do I heat it up? Or do I cool down the system? What do I do to push equilibrium to the right? Alex? So is this mostly for like um, some chemicals can only be made through an equilibrium reaction? Correct. So that's why you're looking to it. That's it. correct, yeah. <laughs> All right, now, so what we're saying here is it's simply an application of how do we maintain equilibrium? Because as I said last week, a reaction at equilibrium is a bit like a living organism. It sort of tries to maintain equilibrium. So if you guys get hot, what do you do? You, you try and cool down, okay? And if you're cold, you try and get warm. Okay, you put clothes on. So it's a bit like a living organism, okay? And so we want to have a look at how changes in concentration, pressure and temperature are going to affect the position of equilibrium. Okay? We also wanted to emphasise that when we talk about temperature changes in particular, wherever we give an equilibrium reaction like this one, say, in order to apply this, we need to know the sign of delta H okay, for that reaction. We need to know that when we're starting to apply temperature conditions. If it is a gaseous system, we'd be looking at gases on the left and the right hand side as well. Because pressure will only work with gases. So I can't look at pressure change if I'm using liquids okay, or solids because they aren't going to react with pressure change. That's really important that you get that. Okay? So people try and apply pressure changes when I've got liquids on the left hand side, liquids on the right hand side, and they can't understand why it doesn't make any difference because pressure won't affect liquids or solids. Only gases. Is that applying pressure to the um, to the material itself? Yeah, to the reaction. Yeah, so can you have a pressure change in the atmosphere like inside the system? No, it's an external change. Well, you, you can do it inside the system by adding an inert gas. If you add another particle, yeah. it's not part of the reaction mixture, yeah. that's another way of increasing the pressure. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about that one in a sec. Right. Okay, now, so when we're talking about temperature change, we are assuming, for example, if a reaction is at equilibrium at 25 degrees Celsius, I'm not heating the reaction. I'm not taking it from 25 to 60 and holding it at 60 degrees. Because what happens if I hold it at 60 degrees? 
What happens to equilibrium? If I change the temperature? What happens to the KC value? Does the KC value stay the same? No. No, it won't. I'll get a new equilibrium at that temperature. So if you remember when we introduced the idea of equilibrium, it depends on temperature. So if I do an absolute change in temperature, this system would not work. So the Shetland's principle is, I heat the system for a small amount of time, I look at what happens to the position of equilibrium, but I let it come back to equilibrium again. That's the system that we're looking at. Small changes, application of Le Chatelier's. When we get over to this one, we look at big changes, okay? Which means we're pushing it forever to the right, or pushing it forever to the left, with absolute changes. Now, let's look at each one of these, and we'll see if we can apply them. So, all you have to remember is everything is opposite. Okay, that's all you have to remember. So, if I increase the pressure, of a system that's at equilibrium, according to Lewis Atlas principle, it's going to do what? How was it going to react? So I've increased the pressure of the system. I've decreased the volume, or as Alex said, I've added some more particles to the same volume. What's it going to do? We don't know which, which reaction, which direction at all. I'm just asking you in general, if I increase the pressure, what's the system going to try and do? Decrease the pressure. It's the opposite. Okay? So it's going to try and decrease the pressure to keep the KC value constant according to the Shatley's principle. How does it decrease pressure? How would the system decrease pressure? We spoke about this a few weeks ago when we talked about rate of reaction. So how can a reaction decrease pressure by itself? Okay. Remember we spoke about less particles in a volume? So if we've got 20 particles in a volume and 10 particles in the same volume, the 20 particles in the volume are going to have double the pressure. So if I am a reaction in equilibrium, the only thing I can do to decrease pressure is go to the side with the least moles of gas, the least particles. Now we can't apply that here, because we don't know which one's got gases and how many, how many gases on the left and how many, gases, how many moles on the, on the right. We can't do that. But the general rule is, if I increase pressure, I look at the equilibrium system and it's going to decrease the pressure according to Le Chatelier's principle. So that means it's always going to go to the side with the least moles of gas. It's the exact opposite. If I decrease the pressure, what's it going to try and do? Increase the pressure. It's going to go to the side with more particles, more moles of particles to be specific. I don't get the less particles, more particles. Right. Okay. When we did this a few weeks ago, we talked about this, and we talked about this. This is supposed to be the same volume, isn't it? Okay. So, which of those volumes has got the greatest pressure? That one. Okay. Now, so therefore, if we're looking at this as being a high pressure, this is a low pressure scenario. Alright? So, if I had this, let me just redraw that picture. I want to do it like this. Let's just show you that was an equilibrium. Okay? If I increase the pressure on this system, how would it go lower? Excellent, we'll go this way. Because it's got less particles. Okay? If I decrease the pressure, we're going to go to the right. It's going to try and increase pressure. Yeah. That's what we're saying here. Yeah. Now, th these particles here are the number of moles. Yeah. So, for example, this could be 4 moles of gas. This could be 8 moles of gas. We total up the number of moles on each side of the equation. So, in that case, it's favouring the reactor. In what sense? In that case there. Okay. If I, in this case here, if I increase the pressure, if I increase the pressure for this picture, it's going to go that way. Yeah. It's going to decrease pressure. 
Okay. Try and produce more reactants. More reactants. Yes. It's going to go in the reactants direction. So if I wanted a flavor product here, I'd have to do this system at a low pressure, because then it's going to try and increase. Then it's going to go towards yeah. products. Right. We'll come back to that later. All right. Now, if we've got any sort of reaction, and our reaction is over here, reactants and products. Hopefully, you can understand that if I increase the concentration of reactants. We know that the Kc value is also concentration of products over reactants, and we know that that is a constant. So you can look at it either using common sense, and you can look at it using an expression that is a constant. So for example, if I increase the concentration of reactants, the reactants get bigger. Okay. How do I keep Kc value constant? The bottom line of this reaction is getting bigger. The constant hasn't changed. You want to decrease the reactant? I want to decrease reactant, exactly. But what else do I need to do while I'm doing that, Martin? Increase, increase product, don't I? Yeah. Okay, and that will be a proportional change. So, if I've got more reactants in a reaction, the equilibrium says, wait a minute, I'm not in equilibrium. The reaction says I'm not in equilibrium. So therefore I need more products. And by going to products, the reactants at the same time is going to go down. To go back to equilibrium again. According to Le Chatelier's principle. You always finish off with that. Okay? Every single time you do this. Because right? that's your justification. You're, you're applying the principle to the change. So if I increase, increase, if I increase the reactants, okay, it's going to do this. The concentration of the products has to go up. It's going to force the equilibrium to the right. Increase reactants, opposite, increase products. It's the exact opposite every single time. If I increase products, products are on the right hand side, it's going to go to the left. The outcome for that will be if my products are increased, then my reactants have to be increased because I'm actually pushing stuff over to here. I've got more products, it's going to go back towards reactants. Always the opposite. If I decrease products, if I take products away, here's my products over here, and I'm taking them away from the system, what's going to happen? The reactants are going to go down to produce products. So if we look at it this, if reactants get smaller, products have to get smaller. Okay, I say we can pull equilibrium to the right. If we take the product away, as we produce it, we're sort of like dragging the equilibrium to the right according to Le Chatelier's principle, every single time. Everyone got that? So, so far, increased pressure, well the reaction itself, the system has to try and decrease. How does it do it? Less particles, less moles. Whichever direction that is. Do not learn, it's always to the right. Had students in the past say, if I decrease pressure, then the reaction goes to the right. No, it doesn't. Because each equilibrium you need to take on face value. You have to work out the moles on the right, the moles on the left. What about if we've got two moles of gas on the left and two moles of gas on the right? What happened, Peter? I increased pressure. What's going to happen? It's going to go both ways. Um, both ways. What, which means what? Equilibrium. What will happen in the position of equilibrium? Two miles here, two miles there. Can it move is my question. No. It can't. It doesn't change. So if I have a gaseous system with the moles are the same on each side, pressure won't affect the position of equilibrium. Because it can't. It can't lower the pressure. It can't increase the pressure if I've done the external change on the system. So pressure would not impact on the system 
if there were equal moles on each side. It's exactly the same as what I said before, we've got liquids and solids. Because that would be zero on the left, zero on the right. Zero, zero, we can't change. Pressure won't affect those systems. This is the hardest one to understand, change in temperature. And so we have done quite of this. We spoke about exothermic reactions and we spoke about endothermic reactions. Remember that? Yes. So endo, we said, will absorb heat and we said exo will release heat. So we've got to use those in the context of a temperature change now and see how we go. Alright, so if we're going to warm up the system, we're going to get it warmer by putting it into an oven or whatever, or dialing the temperature of the air conditioner up in the room, okay? If we get it warmer, what's it going to try and do? It's going to try and cool down. Okay, so it's going to try and cool down. So how much does the temperature usually change by? by a, few, a few degrees. So it's not many? No. Okay. No. And we don't hold it at that temperature. Yep, yep. We put it in an oven, yep. we see what happens, we take it out of the oven. Okay. We put it in an ice bar, we see what happens, we take it out. Okay. Okay? But in an industrial application, we put it in the oven and we keep it in the oven. Because you want the price. Because I want it to keep on reacting. Okay? I'm using equipment to my advantage. Alright, warm, cool. I make the system hotter from external, it tries to cool down. If the system is cooling down, which, which way is it going to go? Is it going towards an exo or an endothermic direction? Endo. 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 So, it must go... It must go endo to absorb the heat. It's the only way we can do it. It's got to go endo to absorb heat. Alright. If I cool the system down, it's going to warm up. It's going to try and get hotter. It's going to heat up. In order to heat up, how does it do it? It's got to go exo. When I say go exo, it's going to go in the exothermic direction. So if I were to apply that to this reaction here, whenever you're looking at change in temperature, the first thing you need to get is that. What is the delta H for that reaction? Usually it's given. Sometimes you've got to work it out based on bond breaking and bond forming. Yeah? Going to the right, this is exothermic. Going to the left, the reaction is endothermic. How do I get it? Negative. That way is negative. We know delta H is negative. That's an exothermic reaction. Got it? Mm -hmm. So, if I were to heat this system up, this system here, if I were to heat it up, which direction is it going to go? That way or that way? It's going to go endo. Yeah. Yeah. Heat means endo. Just relate those two together. Heat, endo. So, if I heat it up, the concentration of reactants is going to increase, the concentration of products is going to decrease. For as long as I keep heating it. When I stop heating it... No. When I stop heating it, assuming it returns back to the original temperature, it'll go back and reach equilibrium again. So when the delta H is negative, XO is to the right. Yeah. But when it's positive, XO will be to the left. Correct, yeah. So don't lock these in either. Okay? Since students learn, Oh, when we're doing equilibrium, x is always to the right. No, it's not. This determines which direction is x the sign of delta H. Okay? Alright, in this case here, we said if we hit it up, it goes endo, it goes that way. What about if we cool it down? It's going to go x So, if we wanted to maximise products in this system, I would need to cool the system down for it to favour x According to Le Chatelier's principle. I would say if you, yeah. you Yes, you would need to keep on lowering the temperature, keep it low, so it keeps on going to products, products, products. However, in a few lessons' time, we're going to have to balance two things. 
we have to balance yield with right. Yield with right. So we might be getting a fantastic yield of product at minus 20 degrees Celsius, because it's fantastic. Equilibrium's going all the way to the right. I'm getting 90% yield. However, what's the problem with minus 20 degrees Celsius? Eric? No? It's a right question. I'm going to the right, it's cold. It's cold. Slower rate. Slower rate. Slower rate. So, so, so it's fantastic. I'm getting 90% yield of product, but it's taken me 10 years to get the 100% get me up, get my 90% yield. So you've got to find the best. I've got to experience. find for each system. And we'll look at two. We're going to look at contact process and hyper process. So for each system that we look at, each industrial process, it's a compromise. It's a balance. Uh, do I use high temperature? Do I lose? Do I use low temperature? Do I increase pressure? Do I decrease pressure? This one's obvious, okay? Because if you want a reaction to continue, you're always going to supply reactants to the system. You have to do that, okay? But we look at change in pressure and temperature in an industrial scenario, because that's where the money is. Pressure costs money. Yield. You want maximum yield. But after products, as we said at the beginning. And so what we do is we apply rate and collision theory and equilibrium and the Shatler's principle, we put those together and we say, all right, well, everything in life's a compromise. How do I achieve the most chemical in the least amount of time that's the most cost effective? That's the application. And that's why this is a concept that links perfectly with rate of reaction and enthalpy. All three of these sort of lock together. Okay, everyone call on Mr. Le Chatelier. I'll just call it LCP. LCP, but you have to be able to, to, be able to spell it as well. Okay, we'll leave it at that.